Thank you, everyone. So today is going to be uh, the most amount of negative alpha you'll see at ETH Denver. My thesis is that unless you really think about it and design a token with some purpose, it's going to go to zero. The pressures, the long time longevity is actually hard to get. And it's not something you copy off someone else. You have to be very, very purposeful. So yes, negative alpha <laughs> on how tokenomics work. And this kind of all started, I mean, way back when, but I read a book by Stephanie Kelton called The Deficit, Deficit Myth. And in the book, to kind of uh, paint an image of the US economy going down a drain, they actually use the analogy of a drain to model the US economy. The key point is that flows from the faucet are money, is money printing? government printing money through bonds, issuance, quantitative easing, and the drain at the bottom is taxes you pay. You get rid of the taxes, that lowers the amount of floating um, money. You open the faucet, open the floodgates, more money into the system. And if you look at this, this view, you don't have to believe it, or this is just kind of a, a cool analogy, you have some level of interaction between citizens, the ex executive branch, the Federal Reserve. Turns out if you make the switch that paying taxes burns your funds, a little bit like EIP-1559, you get to a very, very interesting uh, setup. And if you look at this closely and for a long time, you can actually get to a point where you can look at the US government's tokenomics for the dollar, it's actually kind of similar to the tokenomics for ETH and how Ethereum handles supply of the ETH token. And again, one question, burning question, I know you'll want to know the answer. I'll uh, give you the answer at the end of the talk. One of these two systems is highly inflationary and prone to manipulation. Don't, don't, don't shout it. Don't tell the answer. I'll give it to you at the end of the talk. But yes, why? Can a token go to zero? What's the driving force? Not necessarily the US uh, dollar, but any currencies can either go to bouts of inflation. Argentina, for the past decade, they've seen more than, yes, some Argentinian. 50% inflation per year for 10 years. This year, you hit 200. That's great. But that's <laughs> value uh, of your uh, currency going down with respect to gold, Bitcoin, US dollars, you inflate the supply, the net buying power goes to zero. If it's a stock like WeWork, 98.8% uh, <laughs> decrease over four short years, it's also value of a company, whatever its asset, goes to zero. Uh, and, and, and it's actually quite striking. Uh, now it's bankrupt. Another thing, FTX, the FTX token, maybe it has some value, but the event of a collapse of an exchange means that no one wants to be associated with that token, that uh, entity, sell it immediately, dumps to zero. So whenever there's these interesting um, dynamics happening, people respond, they try to fix it. And again, the, the person from Argentina can tell me if it's a good or bad decision, but one way to solve this is to hire a new politician with while ideas that may work and fix the system. In the case of WeWork, you can bring back the same asshole that uh, <laughs> led the token to go to zero. Or in the case of it, FTX, you can hire some good looking version of, of FDF and have him restart FTX. So again, response to the change in value of currencies, stocks, or token typically is dealt with in the meat space world. You change who's at the head, you change how it's controlled, and you hopefully get to a better stage. But when it's tokens, there's no governing body. It's actually decentralized. Whatever decision process needs to happen takes months and uh, is happening over uh, forums. Most of these tokenomics that started in a bad spot will keep going down that slope and Many will go to zero, unfortunately. And when you deal with a token that goes to zero, there's no point in buying. And if you don't have the asset yourself, you cannot do anything. So you just watch it down, go down. 
If you're a bag holder, <laughs> you should get rid of it. If you're just a observer, there's nothing you can do. My pitch, and then that's the only place I'm going to talk about my own uh, protocol, is that you can profit in bear markets using options. I'm the CEO of an options protocol called Panoptic. And if you have a bearish view on tokens, could be ETH, could be any asset, there's a wide variety of strategy that allows you to get that negative alpha. You know it's going to go down, you send, send, sell calls, go short perps, buy puts. The options world open up a lot of different strategies. That will, if you think that a token will go to zero, will allow you to profit in a way, as opposed to just watch, watch it fall down the cliff. So that's my protocol will allow you to short all of these tokens. The rest of the talk is just going to be about why a lot of these tokens will go to zero. So one place where it can go wrong is, and th there's going to be one slide with some math, depending on the background, hopefully you won't get, uh, it's going to be too overwhelming, but one place it can go wrong is the supply control. Argentina printed a lot of, of money. This is the issuance component to it. You issue a lot of tokens, the balance goes up. There's also a burn or a removal from the economy. In the case of the US dollars, maybe in Argentina as well, paying taxes removes funds, depositing into bonds or treasuries removes funds from the circulation. So typically balance, issuance, and in the case of many tokens, the burn rate. And as long as the, the equation doesn't go too wild, you should keep a token supply that's bounded. If the parameters are a bit out of whack, you can go unbounded supply, which is infinite growth and no way to stop it. Or you can go deflationary supply where the token itself, the issuance will go down, too much burn, too much removal from circulation. It's going to become useless or kind of ossified in that stage. What you want to be in this bonded supply is where you know from a mathematical standpoint that you're not going to explode or go to zero, which is two of those are very, very like, unfortunate endpoints. Supply is one way to control this. Another place which is very important is how resilient that supply control is. Uh, again, I'm a physicist by training. You can think in terms of a ball in, on top of different surfaces. But a key point, you want the whole system to be stable to perturbations. We know crypto is volatile, lots of different uh, factors at play. But if it's in a stable equilibrium, it's going to return to its initial state if you perturb it, if you increase the gas, if you print tokens, you want to be in this stable equilibrium. You want to avoid being in this unstable equilibrium where a single perturbation pushes you out down the cliff to the path of uh, explode, <laughs> explosive growth or going to zero. You can be neutral, and that's where you have when there's no real dynamism. It's very, very stale, and overall, it's okay. Not as bad as unstable, but typically you want to be stable to perturbations. And again, another math, it's a dynamical system. You can solve a matrix. The eigenvalues, not eigenlayer, the, the eigenvalues of that matrix tells you about the type of equilibrium. So whatever parameters you throw at this equation, you can solve a very simple, um, again, eigenvalue problem. And you can mathematically demonstrate whether you're stable, unstable, or kind of neutral in your token supply. So let's go over uh, the supply is one of the key aspect of how token value is uh, de defined or determined. There's also demand. So supply and demand have to be in balance. Demand is what's the price? Even though the supply is a million, what's the price that someone is willing to pay for that? So why would you buy a token? To hold, to vote, it has, does it have some utility? that contributes to the demand of that token. What's the intrinsic value of that token? Do you own a part of a DAO? Do you own just future returns, voting power, or just speculation? This will affect what someone is willing to pay for that token. FOMO comes in, I guess, in that <laughs> intrinsic value. When should you sell? You can buy and hold forever, but most companies, most protocols may face a life-ending event. What should you have a profit in mind when do you sell? When do you actually exit that, uh, that system? And also, if you're a protocol, a token launcher yourself, you are in the business of capturing value. Why do you launch a token, really? Why would you do it? Is it the right time? Is it the right model? That's something that is extremely important if you want to be surviving, I guess, for a long period of time. 
So let's do a few case studies. And we'll go over some of the math, but then I'll give you a maybe qualitative picture of these token systems. The first one is the Bitcoin network. You have users that interact with miners and validators. They pay some fees to transact. The miners solve, again, this proof of work to provide security that you're really sending tokens to, to your friends. The way that the miners are rewarded is that their block reward is printed out of thin air, and that's kind of securing all the money spent on validating is rewarded by this reward. So it's a very simple system. Users on one side gain security, pay some fees. Validators on the other side gain some reward and provide that security to that computational power. If you go through that uh, formula, the issuance is basically the only thing that happens, meaning that issuance is known. There's a Bitcoin halving. We know that it's going to go down over time. The burn rate is pretty much absent until, until, unless you burn your keys or send it to uh, the wrong address. There's no burn. So if you just solve for the token supply over time, given that the issuance decreases every four years, you get to a fixed 20 million uh, tokens. It's actually OK. No burn, no change. The value will depend on how much people want to use it. It's one of those neutral equilibrium. Even if you perturb the balance, the supply, the demand, it's not going to change much because you're in that state where, besides losing your keys, there's no dynamic to the token supply. So the only value is how much you value security. That's how much you're willing to pay. So again, we'll show a few of those examples. But Bitcoin has a neutral type of equilibrium. It has value by network effects. You trust that the Bitcoin has value. Everyone trusts it, so that's how you gain some value from it. That's Bitcoin proof of work, kind of neutral, fixed token supply. Somewhat boring, but kind of works. Let's look at layer one tokens like Solana that has some staking uh, component to it. You have a new path for, uh, again, attaining block reward. You still have validators, very, very uh, advanced high tech, uh, again, computers, users pay some fees to the validators. There's a burn mechanism as well in, in Solana. They get security, so the right-hand side is very similar. You also have ways to stake your SOL tokens, get some rewards, get your piece of the pie so that the validator translates this back to you to some extent. We can look at the issuance and burn. The burn is that, again, burn your fees, so we know it, it's kind of somewhat dependent on the activity. And the issuance, I didn't know too much, but the schedule is that it's going to stabilize to a fixed inflation rate of 1.5% for Solana sold tokens. So it starts fairly high now. It's going to go down over time. And eventually, it's going to be fixed. So the issuance is going to be constant over time. And that burn will vary with network activity. And that is, again, what makes it a tiny bit unstable. You can stake as well. And currently, a lot of the stake tokens uh, a lot of the balance, or the, the supply is staked, so you have an incentive to stake and get passive returns. And you have uh, a natural removal of tokens from circulation. So the more you wait, the less supply is there. It may not compensate for the inflation. And at the same time, the burn rate can vary somewhat widely. And you think about the end state in 25 years, most of the burn will be extremely volatile, extremely high. Most of the tokens will be in that staked uh, system. You go through the math, it's somewhat unstable. So I don't want to offend anyone from, from Solana, but the key point is that the, the actual long term, 10 years plus in the future, given the given externalities, is giving some instability in the price. You could go to a point where everything is staked, and the token price goes very, very high, and no one can use it. Or the burn rate is way, way too high. It doesn't compensate for the 1.5% issuance. Solana, of course, has a lot of value itself. You burn the token, so it has some interesting value. You have some rewards, but it's a bit unstable. Let's go to two more examples uh, and go back to the US government, of course. DAOs, again, I yet try to use these interaction users, interact with smart contracts. They uh, provide some activity, get some benefits. A DAO controls the smart contract. The issuance and burn could be defined by voting. They change depending on the voting mechanisms. In, if no one votes, it's very stale. If everybody votes, it can be taken over. 
depending on how you do it, there could be a burn that happens in waves or there could be no burn and, and fixed supply. All of this is managed by DAOs, humans, uh, various individuals. Could go wrong without saying it's certain, but it could go wrong. So that means inherently it's unstable because all of these parameters, if they could be changed, they could be taken over. If they don't change, you get to a stale state. Most of the time it's unstable, so the token supply could either go to zero, infinity, print, no one, one really knows. One key thing, and that's a very recent development, I think Uniswap, of course, but a lot of protocols are realizing this, that the token itself has, has some value. Uh, what they are enshrining is the fees now will be collected from the smart contracts. It's going to the DAO controlled, uh, again, staker. Their fees flow back to the users that participate in voting or delegation. Now you get some uni token, you delegate, you have a direct connection between who you delegate to and how much fees you collect. So there's a natural feedback. And the active delegation and fee means that now it's actually a, a kind of a bit better. You get rid of some of the instabilities. You don't burn any tokens, which is what I don't like. But overall, it creates a value for the token that is clear. If you delegate to XYZ, they give you a fraction. They, they vote for, for a turning on the protocol fee. They give you some value. So in that case, Uniswap is stable or unstable, but rather uh, the, the, the value of the token now has a clear meaning. It's not just voting for XYZ, but it's voting for you, the <laughs> delegator, getting more revenue. The last one is Ethereum, the granddaddy of all token systems, getting a little bit more complex, getting uh, still able to analyze this using the parameters. There is burn, EIP-1559. This is very important. You burn some tokens. You spend it to gain economic activity. As a user, you don't mind because you may make 10x that in an NFT trade or a Uniswap trade. So that's good. Lots of burn. The other thing is the issuance. Again, square root of the number of tokens staked dictates how much you issue over time. So this is a, a Vitalik had a post about this, like not linear, not square, let's do square root, who cares? But at the end, that creates a very, very interesting dynamics. If everyone stakes, it's square root of the number of tokens, so the diminishing returns uh, you get from adding all your tokens to the staking pool. If no one stakes, then you can get more proportionally. So square root creates very interesting dynamics. Uh, you have uh, the balance of the two means that, again, alter some money. You have changing supply, can go up, can go down. In the times when it goes down, it's because there's a lot of burn. In the times when it goes up, is that there's less burn, issuance brings it back. So it adds some two-sided action. And if you go through the analysis, it's actually a stable equilibrium. This might be complex, but you perturb it, and it's going to relax with some time scale to a fixed supply. So if burn rate changes, activity changes, number of stakers changes, it's actually resilient. It's not going to go off to zero infinity. That is a very, very clear example of a stable equilibrium. ETH, in my opinion, has the best economics. Protocol should emulate both the square root issuance, it diminishing returns, and also the burn rate that happens. So that is somewhat of a, a summary slide. E at the end is very, very uh, well designed. Whether they intend it or not, it gives this stable equilibrium, which is kind of unseen in most protocols. Um, back to the initial point, <laughs> US government and uh, token supplies. There's some, again, if you squint, there's the user citizen analogy, there's the execution layer, executive branch analogy, consensus layer, Federal Reserve. That's as far as going to push this. But there's also some interactivity between the different components. Burn in EIP-4159 Ethereum is clear. You spend your tokens to get reward. This is also a different way of looking at it. But if you pay taxes, those taxes don't go and fund, fund roads. They print new money for roads. They take your money and burn it. You pay taxes so that you stay in the system. They take your money. It's gone. They print out of thin air what they need. But similar to EIP-1559, you can issue more tokens. So very quickly, uh, that means that it's going up to the right, burning the taxes issuance very, very uh, uncorrelated. However, it's stable in, in its uh, explosivity. It's going to go up forever. Regardless of how many taxes you pay, how many uh, issuance you do, it's always going to go up. This is a stable, exploding type of system. 
So I'll end it here. And uh, that's the takeaway. <laughs> ETH has a good supply because it's stable. USDC has a stable supply, but it's always exponentially increasing. Go and do what to do with this. But they also figured out a stable way. It's not going to change if uh, the end of what happens. It's always going to explode. So thanks, to everyone. Remember, if it goes to zero, you can trade options to profit. Otherwise, stay away from those tokens that haven't figured out the tokenomics yet. All right, thank you.